of an overview on the Sector Policy Institute. We are a think tank. We uh, have scientists and luminaries that we're putting out front that are doing briefings and meetings. As a matter of fact, we're doing a, another round of briefings in February and also are writing articles and we're tracking the fellows on a daily basis. But you'll be hearing more about the fellows from that line. And we also uh, run a coalition where we facilitate coordination and office back, offer back office support for all of the groups within the coalition. So the next topic I want to bring up has to do with uh, a program called Community Action Network and Parent Teacher Community Action Network. We're working with our advisory board member, Stephen Ohl, in Arizona on this project. And we have a website. You can have a look at it there. It's under communityactionnetwork.org or ptcan.org. And so basically, it is a way for secular people to have an organization or have a project within an organization that they're already involved in so that they become leaders in the community and they're able to find the needs of the community and solve problems. Now, the Parent Teacher Community Action Network, we'd like to see one of those in every school and this is relevant to the U.S. and also internationally. And so it's a way to create strong schools. It's also a way for sector leaders to get involved in science clubs and help the schools in any way possible. And then also their groups can meet at the schools because, uh, especially in the U.S., the school facilities are open to the public. Uh, so we've got uh, all kinds of programs and looking for leaders I've met with uh, several in the last month that are interested in starting uh, chapters of PT CAN or CAN. So that'll be a big push for 2016. Uh, now, moving on to the World Future Guide, we did release the World Future Guide and we had uh, 10 fellows who wrote brilliant articles that run the gamut on topics. And the most recent article was written after the climate change meetings in Paris, and we were able to add that in, and we'll be getting that article to uh, the House and the Senate and all the congressional staff that have the environmental climate change portfolio, and that's thanks to our uh, Romanian fellow who was the uh, Minister of Environment there in that country, so thank you for that well-written article. And uh, so have a look. These. Um, guides for Congress and for decision makers are quite common for think tanks. I've uh, read probably five or six from other groups, uh, you know, Cato, CSIS, Heritage, you name it. Uh, they're all starting to come out uh, in the end of December and early January, and of course we have ours also. Now we have other uh, resources. We have the Sector Resource Guide that came out in the summer, and we have the U.S. Policy Guide. Uh, that uh, it has is something that's been around for several years that I worked on when I was at the Sector College of America that is available to all U.S. secular groups and we're hoping to get that updated this year. Now moving on to the monthly conference schedule, we have down the dates for 2016. So it's always the first Thursday of every month. So it's only once a month, so that's not too burdensome and only for one hour. And we do not have the conference calls in August and December. And we're still looking for national and regional leaders that can uh, help us with policy issues by region or in a particular country. Now, I'll turn it over to Madeline, and she'll give us an update on what the busy fellows have been up to over the last year. Thank you, Edwina. And there is quite a hefty list today of those that we are highlighting with any recent news. I'm going to skim it. And again, those of you who are online with us can read it yourself because I don't know that I'm the best reader, but I will just give a, a brief summary for those of you who are only with us via phone. Uh, we're highlighting Amatia Baram, who gave a report on the state of Lebanon in a recent article. We have the link online. Gregory Benford is a multiple award-winning science fiction author who also delves into very real scientific queries. And he's a contributing editor of Reason Magazine, who recently wrote an article about Pluto for Air and Space Magazine and has published an adventure novel, Against Infinity. All links, again, available online. 
Elliot Cohen is a philosopher who's one of our fellows, and he's written 25 books, including What Would Aristotle Do? Self-Control Through the Power of Reason and The Theory and Practice of Logic-Based Therapy. He is one of the contributors, contributors to the World Future Guide. A.C. Grayling, a very famous name, is one of our fellows, and he spoke to the BBC on the meaning of life, uh, according to Ali Yar. Oh, I can't pronounce that. I'm so sorry. Um, but he wrote about the Middle East immigration crisis in the irony of migrancy. Marty Klein is a, uh, a speaker on sex education. And he has been dealing also with issues of immigration. And there are interesting links here on the website. Uh, Ayman Jawad Al-Tamimi contributed to the World Future Guide and has given Middle East policy advice all over the Internet. Mark Jurgensmeyer wrote about how co cooperating with Iran might actually help the U.S. defeat ISIS and many other interesting articles. Patrick Lindenforce has written about Europe's immigration emergency in Refugees Crisis, Humanists Call for a Strong and Humane EU Response. Elizabeth Loftus, another very notable name, was interviewed recently by NPR about false memories, and that article and thinking has been published throughout the internet, and has also given a TED Talk called How Reliable Is Your Memory? Kevin Perot, uh, one of our newer additions, is a leader in the movement to extend the natural health span of humans so that people could feel as healthy as 40 years old in their 80s. We interviewed him at length for one of our newsletters. And Michael Semple, another name you'll see a lot across the internet, uh, is a visiting research professor in the Institute for the Study of Conflict Transformation and Social Justice at Queen's University, Belfast. He's written an article for the International Institute for Strategic Studies that's a recommended read of ours, Making Peace with the Taliban. All of our daily news clips, which are not self-published, but gathered from around the internet, which include a survey of some of the most popular fellows articles or mentions of our fellows in the media, uh, they're available on our website. And we have a link right here that you can follow to register for both that and our fully original newsletter, which Johnny Monserrat spearheads. And I am going to link to the sign up for our newsletter here on the internet while also handing the microphone over to Johnny to tell us about what he's up to. Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Johnny. Hello. Well, the most the most exciting thing happening here is, of course, the World Future Guide. If you're on the newsletter, then perhaps you've seen that. But we just added a 12th article from a fellow, Sylvian Ionescu, who writes about climate change. So if that interests you, uh, go back to the website, and you'll find it there on the resources page. It's one of our original uh, reports on the survey section. So that would be the website, then the reports menu item, then survey. Uh, also, uh, we just announced a new Google group. So we actually have two of them. Uh, it's a discussion forum called the, uh, what's it called? One of the secular leaders? Leaders something. League. League. Yes, forgive me. Uh, thank you. The idea is that um, these monthly chats are a great way to interact, but a lot of people have more things they want to say or they have things that happen in the middle of the month they want to chat about. Also, we're starting to hit the ground running when it comes to planning some big things, and these groups will be a way for us to communicate. Uh, I'll be announcing it in the newsletter if you haven't already received an invitation, uh, but if you can't wait, email me and I'll add you today. <laughs> but it'll be in, in tomorrow's newsletter. We'll be discussing uh, everything on the future of secularism. Uh, there'll be one group for the United States and then one group for international affairs. We'll be uh, coordinating a conference. We'll be putting together a donors fund that we want to link to uh, investment firms such as Fidelity and Morgan Stanley so that people can choose to have their portfolios go into a secular donors fund. This is for the whole coalition, by the way, not just for us. And we also want to organize what in the entrepreneur world would be a business plan competition. Uh, you may have heard of this. Colleges often do it. 
to get some uh, some people with some good ideas and then give them coaching so they can present their ideas more professionally. And, of course, that higher quality helps draw in big donors. And, of course, we love and know the donors that we already have in the secular community, but there are a whole bunch of donors in the wider world that are looking for you know a bit higher quality, perhaps because they're not quite as 100% involved with the secularism movement. And uh, we'll be drawing in some more of those people as well. Uh, these things are all at the planning stage, and hopefully through the Google group discussion lists, uh, you'll take part in helping us to organize and plan and trade ideas. And if you've got needs and want us to juice you up, that's what we're here for. Our entire job is to basically help our coalition members do some awesome stuff. And that's the report. Thank you so much, Johnny. Uh, I'm also linking now to the subscription page and sharing that in the chat window. Johnny's uh, spearheaded newsletter can be found here as well as the uh, reclaimed articles in the Daily Digest. And you'll notice there are selection boxes to sign up for the original articles or for the sourced articles, either the weekly letter or the Daily Digest. So moving along, we do have public policy updates. And if we have Hugo here, then he can give us a Latin America update. Hugo, are you available? All right, we will come back to Hugo if he arrives. And I doubt we have Morgan Elizabeth Romano with us, but I will check. Are you here, Morgan? Well, both Hugo and Morgan are, are people on the ground in their various regions, and uh, we love hearing from them. They're a big part of our coalition. So when they join us, we always like to get uh, as local an update as possible about their legwork and groundwork. But I will quickly highlight some of the many recent letters that we have done for our advocacy campaigns. And again, you can follow this online or on the agenda and also find it under the coalition tab, advocacy campaigns. We were able to send a comment letter about healthcare discrimination. We also had several sign on letters go out over the past few months, one on Saudi Arabia's seat on the UN Human Rights Council, Another asking for an inclusive policy for police vehicle decals, one on a child's right to Medicare, medical care is the way that we listed it here. We also did receive a response on one of our letters, and, and there are actually several responses posted if you follow the links. But this one in particular is our request for UN asylum for those Bangladeshi authors that were threatened. And uh, we also did also submit a, uh, a group of comment letters to various uh, U.S. agencies, and those are, again, all available on our website. Edwin, is there anything you want to add about those? I know that we covered a bit of that at the beginning. Uh, no, except for all the letters on the website, the responses that we're getting in, we're also putting on the website, and we'll continue to push the, the responses out. It'll be easier when we have the Google group and just so that people know we're going to invite everyone who's in the database as members for the international one, all 305 groups and then the U.S. one, only the 197 groups. But then also if other secular leaders around the world would like to get into either group chat, they will be welcome and we'll be able to, we'll moderate those. So, we'll be able to put letters out there also and get more sign-ons. And when we get responses, we can drop them there also, uh, in addition to having them on the website. But I know that we've got quite a few speakers here, so I'll go ahead and turn it back in to you, uh, Madeline, so that you can get the speakers in the queue. Wonderful. So at the top of our queue is Margaret Downey. And if, Margaret, you are here, we'd love to hear from you. Margaret is the former yep. president of Atheist Alliance International and founder and president of the Free Thought Society. Hello, Margaret. Hello. And it's such an honor to be on this call with such esteemed people. And thank you very much for the work that the Secular Policy Institute is doing. Uh, I'm just a small fry, but uh, I 
have a great love and admiration for the work of Thomas Paine. And his life legacy has been demeaned because of his, um, what people con construed as atheistic viewpoints. What he was was a free thinker. And we um, honor his date of birth every January 29th. And we honor his date of death to look at his life in retrospect, which is June 8th. So um, I'm asking people on his birthday or before his birthday uh, to make plans to visit our website and get some ideas about how to honor his life. Um, there's a link provided on the information that was distributed for this call. And um, very excited about having a little bit of creed money already to get a statue created for the Philadelphia area and a um, compilation of original songs honoring Thomas Paine's life, along with the children's coloring book that is all written, uh, but I'm looking for uh, illustrators to complete that project. And again, I do have a little bit of seed money for those projects. Uh, please uh, note that there is a statue, a golden statue of Thomas Paine in Paris, if you'd like to visit that on his date of birth. Um, and that's located in a park, but I don't, don't have the name of the park on hand, I'm driving, but it's uh, easily found. It's part of the University of the Sciences in Paris. Uh, and then there's a golden statue of Thomas Paine in Setford, England. Uh, they always have a celebration in January to honor his life and legacy. So if you're in those areas, please take a look. Um, the golden statues have two meanings. Uh, one is, of course, to honor him, but the second is that Napoleon said that there should be a golden statue of Thomas Paine in every uh, city of every country. <laughs> so that's the nature of that. But thank you for listening, and um, thank you so much for your support. Thank you, Margaret. And I have shared your website here online, and I've also included it in the chat window. I've also included your email address. I hope that wasn't too forward of me so that people can contact oh, not you. Not at all. <laughs> no. Thank you so much. Any Thank you. future inquiries, you're welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Margaret? Good. Well, you'll welcome. Like oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it sounds like a great project. Thank you so much. We are very excited. Good, and, and you're all welcome to ask questions at any time. You can always star six to unmute yourself on your phone. Uh, we are going to move on if Bob Churchill is with us. He is the Director of Communications mm -hmm. of the International Humanist. Uh, no, no, Edwina? <laughs> you know, um, actually, actually, uh, Madeline, uh, Bob Churchill's information goes under John Wagner, and we were uh, had his information because he released the Freedom of Thought Report 2015 in December, and so uh, we had asked John was coming on to talk about that report and what's going on at the UN. Oh, good. So I thought we had both of them, but we just have John, which is just as wonderful. Uh, is John with us now, John Wagner? It sounds like maybe John is chiming in. John, you there? I'm hearing sound, but no voice. If, if he's not able to get on before the call is over, Madeline, I met with him in New York in November, uh, and I have the information about the report and what they're doing. I have his report, so I can give it if he can't get on. Should we, the end of the call. should we wait a few moments? Maybe he's coming a little later. Yeah, yeah. We'll check back before we end and see if uh, if he's there. Okay, wonderful. So okay. Doug Thomas is next on our agenda. He's the president of Secular Connexion Secular. I'm not going to pronounce that correctly. I'm so sorry. Um, Doug, are you with us? I think I am. Okay. Um, can you can you please introduce your group better than I did? <laughs> Okay, Secular Connexion Séculière. Thank you. Is a national group uh, that tries to do essentially what Freedom from Religion Foundation does in the United States. 
Uh, we have to do it differently for two reasons. One is our constitution is different, and secondly, uh, we don't have nearly the resources they do. So, but other than that, that's a pretty good summary of what we tried to do. Um, do I should can I continue with yes, talking please. about the Take political the scene? Uh, now I didn't have time to translate this, so I hope everyone understands Canadian. <laughs> the uh, we and I wanted just and I'm never quite sure when I'm talking to an American audience or any audience outside of Canada how familiar people are with Canada's system of government. So I'm going to just quickly go through it so that you understand some of the wrinkles that I'm talking about. Um, we have uh, what is a constitutional monarchy uh, with a direct copy of the Westminster government, which is to say we have an elected House of Commons, uh, which is really where the big change came on October 19th, uh, and we have an appointed Senate. So our House of Commons is roughly equivalent to the United States House of Representatives. Our Senate is not equivalent to anything. It's a complete anomaly in Canada. Uh, which is part of the problem. At any rate, uh, prior to October 19th, which was our election day, uh, the government was a majority conservative government. And they, this particular version of conservative is sort of equivalent to kind of the left wing of your Republican Party, uh, but so we're not nearly as far right as your politics are. But uh, at any rate, the government was run by a guy named Stephen Harper, a fundamentalist Christian, and uh, probably a climate change denier, although he was too clever to say it. And he basically, when, when you have a majority, which he had in the House of Commons, you essentially have a dictatorship in Canada, because in addition to that, he had a majority in the Senate, so that anything he wanted to go through Parliament went through Parliament to the Senate, and after that, there's no check and balance except the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, so he, uh, to give you an example, his Minister of Science was a fundamentalist Christian, creationist, and climate change denier. So <laughs> um, we have a tradition in Canada that we tend not to elect governments, but to defeat them. In this case, that's essentially what everybody wanted to do, and we managed to do it. Uh, on October 19th, we all went in the ballot box. And in Canada, by the way, as, as Jimmy Carter noted, we, we vote in a cardboard box with a pencil. Um, very simple. Uh, each um, riding or electoral district elects a member of parliament. The party that elects the most member of parliaments is asked by the governor general on behalf of the queen to form government. Um, don't have to have a majority, just have to the most seats. So in this case, there are 338 seats in the current House of Commons. The Liberals won 184, which gives them a majority. It's quite a shock, actually, because they started out the election in third place, uh, but ended up in first place. Um, and so they have majority government, and if they had the same circumstances former Prime Minister Harper had, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and his party would be able to just push things through and correct a lot of the problems that Harper left, or, or maybe create others. Um, but the Senate is sitting there, and it's appointed by essentially, and I don't need to wade you through the Constitution of details here because it's very boring, but uh, they are basically appointed by the parliament or the uh, prime minister in power. Since the conservatives were in power for 10 years or nearly, they managed to appoint enough senators that there's now a conservative majority in the Senate. So there are 45 conservatives, 28 liberals, 10 independent, and 22 vacant seats. So what Justin Trudeau has promised is to have a commission that will promote or the idea of having uh, more gen more um, objective senators. The whole idea of the Senate is to have a house of sober second thought. Well, if the house of sober second thought is dominated by the same people who are in the House of Commons, that doesn't work, obviously. So that's what he's doing. But in the meantime, there's a potential that a lot of the legislation that the Trudeau government passes could be stopped in the Senate. Um, 
at any rate, um, basically Harper's style was to be the leader and the ruler, and his senate, his his cabinet ministers basically just followed his lead. But Trudeau's cut from entirely different cloth and pledged in the election that he would run a more democratic government, and so far he seems to have done so. Uh, there are 30 cabinet ministers and new cabinet ministers. 15 of them are women and 15 are men. And Trudeau was asked about that by a, a very senior reporter. And I think she almost felt that she was giving him a lead question to give a good positive answer. And she said, why is it so important to have a gender equal cabinet? And he said, it's 2015 and gave that famous Trudeau Gallic shrug that he that his father was so good at and he imitated it. Anyway, by the way, another interesting thing, fifty percent of those cabinet ministers did not swear on the Bible when they were sworn in. Uh, in Canada we have a system where you can make an affirmation and that applies to anybody from a municipal councillor up to the governor general. Uh, once they were in the cabinet Trudeau wrote a, a mandate letter to each one of them and said, this is what you're responsible for. Please get on with it. Uh, you know the liberal policies? Go with it. Completely different style than Harper, who has all his cabinet ministers under his thumb. Just to give you an idea of the difference, uh, we now have a Minister of Environment and Climate Change who happens to be one, the Honorable Catherine McKenna, who is a an internationally recognized lawyer, lawyer has practiced law in Jakarta, um, is at, has been called to the bar in Ontario and New York State, so just the right person to be in place to look after things like climate change legislation and so on, especially since she has to deal with 10 provinces and three territories as well. Uh, our Minister of Justice and Attorney General is a lady named the Honorable Jody wilson Rebo. She's Aboriginal and she's a former chief of one of the nations in uh, British Columbia. And that's important because one of the major things that she has to deal with is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, which is dealing with all those residential schools where basically Christian churches in collaboration with the government um, kidnapped Aboriginal children, threw them into residential schools where they were abused and you know the list of abuses that could happen there. They were starved, they were beaten, they were raped, they were killed. Um, and so all that has to be uh, figured, uh, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee has come up with 94 recommendations the Trudeau government intends to try to work on all of those over the next four or hopefully eight years. Um, she also is going to deal with the question of physician-assisted suicide. In February of 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada said that the law that pro prohibited, in that case, medically assisted suicide, um, was unconstitutional and gave the government a year. They suspended their decision, gave their government a year to get it right. So if this government and doesn't do anything, by February 16th, medically assisted suicide will be legal in Canada without any controls or checks and balances or anything. So this government has applied for an extension. Uh, Secular Connection Seculier made a submission to the Harper Commission. We're going to resubmit that to um, the Liberal, the Trudeau Commission, and we hope to influence how medically assisted suicide is de delivered in Canada. Uh, you can see that report, by the way, on our website, www.secularconnection.com. Dot CA. Uh, it's connections both of the next. Um, and there also there's the issue of Section 296 of our criminal code, which are, is our anti blasphemy law. It says it's illegal to commit blasphemy against religions in Canada. And Section 319.3b, which gives permission to the um, for religious people to make any kind of outrageous hatred statements they want. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at our website now, and you just need to scroll down to pass the new version of the National Anthem, and you'll see, I think, um, it's, it's the second or third article I'm down now, I think. Uh, yeah, there we are, October 19th. 
submission to the external panel and options for legislative response. Carter versus Canada was the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court uh, court case that I referred to. So you can read through that and basically see what Secular Connection Seculaire is saying. Um, but 3193B of the Criminal Code of Canada gives people permission to make um, hatred statements. So for example, you can make an anti-Semitic statement as long as you can claim that, oh, it's in my Bible and I believe that, um, and so on. So we want, obviously, we want 296 and 319 taken out of there. Um, just by way of interest, again, to highlight the differences the, minister, the new Minister of Science is uh, Dr. Kirsty Duncan, who is a medical geographer and anthropologist, which is an interesting title. She is a person who wrote a definitive report on the uh, Spanish influenza epidemic of 1919 um, through research, um, contrasted to the former minister that I mentioned, who was a creationist and a climate change denier. So lots of changes there. The big, the big benefit to us, the big change for us, is this, this government is much more open to hearing us. Uh, I got into some uh, rather negative uh, letters with John Baird, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, in the Harper government, who um, made a statement at the United Nations that our Charter of Rights and Freedoms did not protect the right to freedom from religion, which is in complete contradiction of the Supreme Court of Canada, which says it does. Uh, I called him on that in a blog, and uh, he, his people were got after me, and I just gave them the evidence and heard no more from them. I got into a discussion with Peter McKay, who was then Attorney General and Justice Minister, about physician-assisted suicide, and this was prior to the Carter decision that you're looking at on the screen, and he uh, um, very definitely informed me that this law was constitutional, and at which point I wrote him back and explained that actually the Supreme Court was about to decide that. And by the way, 80% of the 84% of the people in Nova Scotia, which is his local riding, or his local writings in Nova Scotia, uh, supported medically assisted suicide. So, so a little bit of satisfaction there on my part. But bottom line is that the the ministers, first of all, are qualified for the positions they're in. They're not political flunkies. Um, they've hit the ground running faster than any other cabinet I've ever seen in Canadian history, uh, all kinds of international conferences and so on. And basically there's more autonomy. I think we're going to get more open discussion from, from those ministers and I hope we'll be able to get more headway. And uh, those, those who remember the Freedom of Thought report from the IHEU and the United Nations, Canada is clearly designated as a country that systemically discriminates against atheists. So um, the whole country is its really strange because it's almost like a don't ask, don't tell policy. Um, nobody says they're an atheist, your employers don't pay attention to it, but if they find out you are, it can have dire consequences. So its it's a very strange kind of um, relationship and that's what we're trying to fight against here. We're not being dragged out in the street by the RCMP and thrown in the jail but we are there are um, again if you look on the SCS website you'll see there are two of our executive listed there. The other two people prefer to remain anonymous because they know their jobs could be negatively affected by atheists. So that's where we are in Canada. Hopefully, it's, we're, we're really happy about this new government. We're seeing a lot of potential for change. The hard work remains. So I don't know whether you have some questions about that or if I can clear some things up or whatever. But that's where we are. Uh, this is Margaret Downey. This is Margaret Downey. I have a question and comment. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes. Um, first of all, are you keeping a database of incidences of discrimination against atheists in Canada? Uh, we are. We're working on that. Uh, difficult to. Um, the ones that 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 seem to come to the fore are cases where people take their case to one of the uh, tribunals, uh, human rights tribunals. 
Um, and that's where we tend to get the information because people either don't say anything or they come out to a human rights tribunal. Uh, we have asked our, the local organizations, and for example, in Ontario, there's something like 70 different atheist organizations across the province, and they're probably in Canada a total of, I'm going to say maybe 110. Um, so we have asked them for input from that, but um, we haven't developed really a full database on that yet. I would like to share how I established that type of database in the United States. Um, I can give you all the basic information that um, we use to start the anti-discrimination support network. Are you connected to Chris DiCarlo? In oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Chris. You, need to talk, you need to talk to him. Uh, he and I talked about this years ago, and I thought he was uh, trying to get that started in Canada. Um, but my second comment is that um, in May, May 18th, I believe the weekend is, we are having a wonderful conference in Canada called Imagine No Religion. Yeah. And actually mm -hmm. it's going to take place in Vancouver. And uh, we wanted to make sure everybody knows about it that's on this call. Uh, one of our wonderful speakers will be A.C. Greeling, so uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's one of the fellows. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I'm familiar with that conference. That's a big conference in Canada. Um, good. Well, I'll be a speaker there too. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, we just had one in August, by the way, and, and this anti discrimination or the anti blasphemy law came up, and I was on the panel on that. But yeah, so we're seeing more of those, but Imagine No Religion is a really big one, and a lot of important people um, come there is with a lot. Is it on the Secular Policy Institute calendar? Could someone check that for me since I'm driving? I could. Oh, yeah. yeah. We we always have it on, on there, Margaret. We had it on there last year. And I'm okay. sure we'll have it updated. We'll have it on there. It's yeah. it's every May. So so now, Doug, are, where are you located? Are you guys headquartered in Ottawa? Are you in Montreal? Where are you? <laughs> no, actually, we have we have three locations effectively. Um, I'm in a place called Elmira, Ontario, which is just about an hour and a half northwest of Toronto in Ontario. Um, we have a Winnipeg, Manitoba node, if you like, and a, Van a Victoria, uh, BC node. So we're spread all the way across the country through three or four time zones. <laughs> Makes interesting. So, uh, most we are primarily a in terms. We don't have any bricks and mortar really. We're we're primarily a, an, an internet um, kind of organization, um, and I deal with as many of the local organizations across Canada as I can. Certainly in Ontario, we have the Atheist and Light Ontario Network, which is a network of those seventy organizations I mentioned. Um, and I'm past president of a local group here. So that's kind of how things go in Canada. Um, uh, Doug, hi, it's Edwin again. Have you guys done any work on the issue in Ontario where the government, the taxpayers, fund the Catholic schools in trying uh, to eliminate that? We we do work with what's called one school, um, which is trying to eliminate that. Uh, that's a constitutional problem. Um, in uh, in 1867, and putting Canada together was always a big compromise. They they one of the things they had to do to get the provinces for them to sign on was to grandfather some of their legislation. And one of the pieces of legislation that they grandfathered was any funding for what they called at that time minority schools, which is appropriate because in, in Quebec it was Protestant schools and in Ontario it was Catholic schools. In, Canada, in Upper Canada or Canada West, which became Ontario, had a Scott Act. And so that's embedded in Section 93 of the Constitution Act. There is a great discussion about whether that um, is... Uh, in fact, it intended to stay there, and in fact, they've managed to get it out of Quebec, so there's only one funding. The 
Uh, other issue in Canada, in Ontario was or is that subsequent to that they were, uh, it only was funding up to the end of grade 8 originally. That's been extended to the end of grade 10 and finally to the end of grade, well then grade 13, we now have grade 12, but um, those things could be probably changed and they've been challenged. Um, in Canada to challenge something like that, by the way, you have to prove that you're personally involved. So here's a difficulty with that uh, separate school system, which the United Nations has attacked, by the way, for other reasons than we would. But they, uh, you have to be negatively proved that you are negatively affected by this law or by this organization. Uh, it's hard, hard to do that with an education system. So somehow we've got to find a way to, to in order to challenge this, to get it to the Supreme Court, uh, that someone is negatively affected. We've had people take the separate school boards to court and force them to stop making religious studies a requirement. So they can't do that anymore. So now students can attend the Roman Catholic school board school, if it's the closest one to them and so on, um, and they don't have to take the religious courses. Those kinds of things are he, he, a person managed to point out that this would affect his family negatively because uh, the public school was not readily available to them and uh, so they're in effect being forced to take Roman Catholic religion. Uh, so those kinds of things can happen but uh, yes we are working uh, and it's going to take a while to get um, some kind of change in the Constitution. And by the way, the Constitution in Canada is quite difficult to amend. Um, you have to get 10, uh, sorry, uh, seven of the 10 provinces with more than 50% of the population to agree to the change. And the problem with that, of course, that means you either have to have Ontario or Quebec on board. But in effect, um, the Supreme Court is in, has, has actually ruled that in many cases you need 100% agreement from the provinces. Um, I don't think that would be the case with this one, but the trick is to get it to the Supreme Court, and that's hard to do. Or unless we have a massive constitutional conference and reform everything, the Senate, and this kind of nonsense and so on. Sounds like it. Well, what a brilliant report. Thank you, Don. We, we really appreciate it. It sounds like we... Uh, you have some very unique problems there in Canada, but then you also have some that uh, other countries are facing also. Yeah, and we and we recognize that we're not in in you know when we compare ourselves to say Bangladesh, uh, who by the way is human right, whose anti-blasphemy law is based on the same law ours is, because they're a member of the Commonwealth. Uh, but uh, the uh, we recognize that they have far more serious problems than just. I know you have a letter writing campaign, and often what I'll do and and I'll either echo your letter or do something similar to our government because most of your letters are dedicated to your uh, Secretary of State uh, who would quite rightly ignore a letter from Canada. So we will write to uh, our Foreign Affairs Minister um, and we don't have ambassadors from people from the Commonwealth Nations. We have High Commissioners so we write them um, and so on. So uh, we're kind of running a parallel um, process when it comes to things outside of Canada. Yes, I've seen your letters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So we just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, well, Doug. I was just thanking you. <laughs> it's Madeline thank thanking you. you. <laughs> um, it's you, you know, uh, Madeline, hey, it's Edwina. I was looking at the agenda and I see that it looks like John Kerbo is missing from the agenda, although I've given all of his materials. No, oh, I he's together the agenda. You are right, and he is on the agenda online, so he was included. Oh, oh, and, um, he oh you corrected here. it. Okay, thank you. Yes, of course, and then I would like to give him a few minutes to speak to us. He's uh, John. You've been updating us regularly, and we want to check in with you. John is the founder of Reason Revival, and I've even posted your information on the website today. So, John, take the floor if you're there. Thanks. Yeah, this will just be a few minutes. Uh, this is a follow-up, but I'm going to go into some more detail and specifics. And the, the main topic here is about um, the idea of converging across different spheres of expertise, um, such as media, cyber, mass communication, and dynamic social science, to include you know culture and psychology and things like that. 
is the focus of this would be sort of a, an umbrella under which we can come together informally in a kind of non-hierarchical sort of collaborative way on the topic of empowering dissidents and free thought movements within Islamic society. And um, what I'll be doing is um, I'm releasing a, a, a proposal soon, probably about five or seven pages or so, maybe ten. And the proposal goes into more detail about this, and uh, it'll, it'll explain more. But it talks about how both Muslim reform movements, and you can include ex-Muslims, as well as the, uh, the people across the secular and science world, um, basically we're working to build solidarity between these two communities. That's been going on for, for a few years now. But the idea here is to try to be on the, under the same umbrella of focus and converge uh, across different professional skill domains. So, for example, uh, empowering a kind of free thought or science movement in a place like Syria or even Iraq or even parts of uh, uh, Muslim communities in the West requires a knowledge and understanding of the nuances and, and, and cultural, social realities on the ground and can include, for example, understanding uh, Islamic jurisprudence and, and the golden age of science within Islam. It can involve understanding the uh, skills of, of, of mass communication as well as how to work within the psychological and cognitive framework of people. So, for example, instead of directly attacking a religion, you could talk about free thought, critical thinking, Socrates, and, and, and let it ultimately be a locally owned bottom-up movement within that Muslim community, where it's actually led by free thinkers and, and activists that are themselves, uh, you know, living in that society. So it's, it's actually just empowering and giving them a voice. And so the uh, one thing I want to talk about quickly is um, and, and first of all, the idea here is to get people that are within this coalition, uh, within SPI, people and organizations that are interested, might be able to contribute or want to want to help. Well, what we can do is we can get them uh, talking, um, you know, get a kind of collaboration going through things like Yammer, Google Documents, email, Skype, things like that. And I can make introductions to different groups in uh, both in the United Kingdom as well as here in New York City and other places. And we'll try to solidify these relationships and get a kind of roundtable collaboration and working group going. So one thing I want to talk about real quick is uh, one uh, a potential hub for this, uh, for directly connecting dissidents on the ground, people with a cause of you know free speech and you know free thinking and things like that. Directly connecting these people that live in closed society with people in free society. Um, is called movements.org and movements.org and I've talked to their people uh, including their uh, their founder and what they do they're essentially movements is, is, is arguably a leading human rights platform because it works the same way Craigslist or Uber works it directly links people that need to, that need support with people that can offer them support and anything from artistic skills computer skills legal skills things like that. So it's a collaborative uh, platform linking the needs of distance on the ground and the voices of people in these, in these countries, from Iran to Saudi Arabia to Syria to places like that, with people in the West or in the free world that want to help. So the idea I think here is this can give uh, this can give us a very good um, uh, understanding of, of what's going on on the ground and, and link us with the pulse of these areas. At the same time. It can be a good hub to organize our conversations around and get more people involved because I think we need more unity and more sort of collaboration coming together on this issue of, of, of uh, the Muslim reform movement and free thought and ex-Muslims and things like that. And at the same time, another thing I want to talk about real quick is a specific focus that, that is going on on the ground is a resurgence of uh, or a, a sort of a, 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 a um, an emergence, I should say, of both closeted ex-Muslims that were previously afraid to speak out, but they're seeing more people doing it, as well as people that are Muslim, but they're very dissatisfied with the status quo and they want to see a more pluralistic civil society. And these voices are out there, and they're abundant, and we need to amplify them, and people like Nacho Nuwaj and others are working to do that. But I think the idea is to bring more people into this. And so one thing that can really help spearhead this is a revival of science and free thinking within Islamic societies. And I outline this in the proposal, and it's a way to build ground-up science movements that are not 
essentially they don't have to be head on hostile to Islam. They can work within the framework of that of these societies in a practical way. Now that said, um, a third thing I want to talk about real quick is an a an example of how we can make this actionable. So one thing we can do is we can work with movements. I can make uh, some introductions to movements.org and to what they do and show people what they want. But we can also identify a few areas um, where we see these free thought movements and these science movements going on. They could be both secular, atheist, or, or Muslim-led, ideally all of them. And we, we, we put together a plan where not only do we people can use the, the movements of our platform and volunteer their skills and their time, we can also identify examples where an actionable, fundable proposal can be put together. And I think this is where um, a gentleman mentioned earlier, I think it was uh, uh, Johnny, talked about business plans and the, uh, the idea of uh, you know, coaching entrepreneurs. And I'm well familiar with this, this concept. The, this is an example where we, that we need more of in, in, this, in this area. So we could put together a fundable proposal. And, and, and I... I think the next step would be finding a way to build direct relationships with donors in a way that is actionable, responsive, and in touch with what's going on on the ground. So, for example, when people like Ayan Hirsi Ali and others speak out, you know, this this required lots of time and effort just to fundraise and try to get the resources to help them. Um, whereas, if we have a built-in mechanism of pre-existing donors and support. And we have an actionable plan that can identify and amplify the voices of these dissidents, give them cybersecurity, media support, physical security through some of our veterans. And I'll, I'll go into all this in the proposal. Um, this, this can already have fun set aside, and it will be about a direct relationship with donors that are conscientious. And it could start with 100K or a million, or, uh, you know, we can figure that out. But the idea is to, to build this direct funding relationship. And one thing I might recommend is. One or a few uh, nonprofits or foundations or something set up, uh, or five hundred ones that can that can be they can, they can be set up in a kind of participatory structure with both Muslim reformer, ex-Muslim, and secular members, and they can be set up specifically to do this. And so, the, the, I think the point of this um, this update is to mainly get people from from your within the Secular Policy Institute that are interested in this idea. Uh, talking more, I'll send out the proposal, and then we can put our heads together and we can figure out some practical ways to do this, um, just to get the conversation started. And I think from there, it'll really pull this together in, in powerful ways. Um, if anyone has any questions or, or uh, thoughts on that in, uh, in the immediate, uh, let me know. And I think there's a PowerPoint that may be attached that I can send out again uh, in slide share or Prezi form that, that goes into some of this. So, uh, yeah, if anybody has any thoughts on that. Thank you so much, John. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds very exciting, John. So, yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> what, 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 is, what is Yammer? I've been hearing about Yammer. And I know you mentioned it, too. What is that? Yeah. It, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's sort of a collaboration space online. I don't know the technical details about it as well, but, for example, uh, you know, if, say you're talking, say you're networking with a couple friends from, you know, Brookings or the Rand Corporation or something, and they're, they're, they want to collaborate on an idea. Then you're talking to other people from another group or a science organization or maybe from the Muslim reform movement, and you want to kind of get them all talking to each other. Yammer can be a way to put them in the same digital space where they can type, they can submit documents, they can um, share ideas, and it's basically the people that, it's just based on membership and inside that collaboration space. So you sign yeah. in, you log in, and then you all share the same space. So it's a professional forum to collaborate. I think you could have multiple Yammer accounts for okay. for different ideas and different groups. For, for different topics, yeah. Well, you're just a, a wealth of information and ideas, and we'd love to hear what you're up to. So we'll let us know specifically what you would like for us to do. Now, you heard that we're about to have a Google Groups where we could communicate. Right now, we're pushing everything out through MailChimp, and people can only right. reply back to us. So uh, we're launching tomorrow the uh, Google Group, U.S. only, and then one for the whole world, which includes U.S. people if they want to be included. Right. Uh, and so uh, a lot of that would be a good way for you to uh, 
communicate with other people in the secular movement. So it will it'll be the largest group of secular science groups around the world in in a way for them to communicate. And it will be open. Uh, you don't have to be a member organization to be in it. It will be open to any secular leader that wants to be added into the uh, group and will professionally monitor it so right. it's, you know, doesn't, doesn't get out of control into any uh, hate speech or anything like that. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, that that sounds terrific. And I also I think someone mentioned the uh, secular leaders league or something. This may be the same thing. But that um, that that uh, is I'll, it. I'll, that 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 is that is it. That's just the name of it. Yeah, secular leaders okay. league. Uh, U.S. Yeah, secular and leaders league and global secular leaders league. And we also will plan uh, a meeting where secular leaders will be invited once a year. Uh, it's probably going to be January 2017, where they can come and, and share ideas, and we'll try to have donors there, and they can present uh, projects, and we can talk about, uh, you know, ethics and how to oversee finances and how to raise money, right. and and then the groups can talk about the projects that they're working on and see if there's any way that we can uh, have joint projects and things of that nature. Okay. Yeah, that that's terrific. And and once again, the key thing here is also the the idea of dynamic social science, understanding behavioral psychology and things like that. That's going to be a very big part of how we reach out to reform uh, the Islamic world and and work with free thinkers and stuff like that. Especially grounded in the understanding of culture, and much what I did in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. But also, I'll I'll, I'll make some introductions with people that are interested with. Uh, some of the other groups I've been collaborating with, and I think from there we could brainstorm how to maybe set up a, a 501 or some kind of presence that would kind of anchor you guys and others to this, uh, to uh, people in New York City and, and other places, or just kind of get create a presence and that can make some of this uh, fundable and actionable. So I'm very excited well, about that. Well, so. and and if you need help setting up a 501c3 or c4 or whatever, we also offer that service for free. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, thanks for having me on the call. Okay. All right. Well, uh, just to wrap up, remember um, I was going to uh, give a talk for John, and all that he was going to tell us about was that the IHEU, that they did release their Freedom of Thought report, which we've been waiting for, and it's a, a major piece is undertaken each year by the IHEU, and it highlights the discrimination and persecution that non-believers face throughout the world. So it goes country by country, and they released it on December the 10th, and they picked that day because that coincides with the Human Rights Day. And uh, so there's a link to the report. When we had our last call the first week in November, and we had Bob Churchill on, who was telling us they were working on it, but it is now done, and it's fascinating. I'm looking at it right now. You, you can see that... Uh, the U.S. is labeled mostly satisfactory, and Canada has systematic discrimination there. And then, of course, some some countries have grave violations. As a matter of fact, there are 13 countries here in the report that can put you to death if you uh, are an atheist, if you do not uh, agree with the state religion. So have a look at that. And uh, that's uh, pretty much everything for this month, and we'll be back to first week in Jan in uh, February, that first Thursday. Yes. Madeline, do you have anything before you close us out? No, just was going to add that it's February 4th, and uh, we will see you then.